Welcome to the Holy Post. Throughout the Bible, God's people are commanded to show hospitality to strangers. But Christian nationalists who are unhappy about the number of immigrants in the U.S. are redefining biblical hospitality and twisting the words of Jesus to justify the deportation of millions. What does their inversion of biblical teachings reveal about Christian nationalists' real agenda? Then, pastor, political science professor, and Holy Post pundit Ryan Burge is back to talk about the surprising data surrounding the political activism of atheists and why the rise of non-religious Americans is dangerous for democracy and destabilizing for society. All of that, plus what does the coverage of the Titanic submersible accident really say about us? Before we jump into all that, a reminder to Holy Post Plus subscribers that we have some brand new content this week, including a new episode of Christian Asks. This time we discuss the connection between anger and idolatry, how Christian leaders who use anger to motivate us actually lead us to embrace false gods. We've also got some brand new merchandise, monthly live streams, exclusive content from our amazing team of Holy Post pundits, and the Holy Post Book Club. So check it out and sign up today at holypost.com. Here is episode 572. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. This is Phil Vischer. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hello, Phil Vischer. Hi. And Caitlin Shess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. We saw you earlier this week. You came in person. You came over to play. It was so nice. Yeah. Yeah. We had a play. Your date. mom invited me over and I came and played. <laughs> And what do you do? What do kids do these days when they get together to play at someone's house? They make videos for YouTube. And that's what we did. <laughs> yeah. We played with a teleprompter. Yeah. 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 You, you used the. There was some messing around with the, the teleprompter. teleprompter for the first time. Yeah. At, it was fun. At DTS, do they have a teleprompter class or like a, you know, no. dealing with the press class you can take? No. They Maybe they should, but oh, they did okay. not. No. Are, are women allowed to use a teleprompter if it's operated by a man? If the oh. words are written by a man, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the, and okay. the teleprompter is manufactured by a man. And what is a Probably. what is a pastor other than an influencer? An influencer. Oh, Phil. Okay, oh, no. and now it's time for the theme song. <laughs> What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, Get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. I just, I just made Caitlin just shudder. She shuddered, visibly. Me and lots of other people. Shuddered. Here's sh my, shudder. here's my flock. I need to influence them. Influencing the flock. No, it's not. That's not working for you. I don't feel great about you don't that. Don't feel great about that. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, we just recorded. We're recording early because it's, I'm out of town all week next week, so we can't record next week. So we're recording two in one week. So it's only been three days since we recorded the last one. So not a ton has happened. Some some Supreme Court stuff happened, which we may discuss, but it was it just happened and we can't discuss it yet. So that might be next week. What did happen in the last week was the continuation of the story about the uh, submersible full of wealthy men. Oh. And, which is, I think, more interesting to me versus the ship full of migrants, that they both went down. One went down with 700 people on it. One went down with five people on it. And all we want to talk about is the one that went down with five people, not the one that went down with 700 people. Um, did you guys follow that? And <laughs> yeah, but to be fair, the one with the five people went down to visit the Titanic where over a thousand people died. Does so it? when no. you add up the total, no, mm -hmm. no sky, mm -hmm. no. no sky. Okay. The only, cause I heard about the migrant boat going down right before I heard about the submersible, you know, I think it happened a couple days before. I mean, the only possible difference is just, and I was talking this with my kids. I, I don't know if you remember back in the 80s. You remember back in the 80s, Caitlin? There was a, nope. big, uh, a kid fell in a well. The classic story of a kid yeah. falling in a well. It was a real thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it really yeah. happened. And it was like two days of all of America's attention. Can they get this uh -huh. kid out of this well? 
you know, in those two days, I don't know, a hundred other children probably died around the country from various natural causes, but we didn't care because this was an unfolding drama. This was like a movie watching it in real time and we couldn't take our eyes off. And that's the only thing that I can really say is that, you know, if the submersible just blew up and boom, that was the story, it would have been a lot less attention grabbing than they're down there somewhere and they've got 90 hours to find them. Let's see what's going to happen, which is very similar to, you know, how long could the child survive in the well? You know, we got to get them out before so it's an unfolding drama. So I get that. But the fact yeah. that the the that the migrant boat got so little attention is is a little um, jarring. Do you think part of it is uh, I mean, there's lots of reasons, I suppose, not all of them good. But one of them is the migrant uh, migrants, not the right word. Refugee, I think, is the better word, right? They, yeah. These are refugees trying to flee from Syria and other places, and they're trying to get into Europe. These are people driven into that circumstance by terrible necessity. And it's tragic and it's horrible. Yeah. Whereas five billionaires getting into a submersible to see the Titanic mm -hmm. chose to do that. Of their, and it's that much more ridiculous. There was only one billionaire in, in this. Well, you and had to pay, what, $250,000 for a seat yeah, but in that one thing? Of the, but one of the guys was the guy who, it's his sub. Another guy is just a French diver who's been to the Titanic 30 times. So they were, you know, but it had okay, to be Okay, but the point, is, yeah. the point is, none of them had to do that. None of them were compelled to be there. They chose to go do this very dangerous thing. Whereas these poor refugees were driven to these circumstances. And there's something more... I don't know, voyeuristic about watching tragedy unfold mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Yeah, I guess so. Then, then I mean, the migrant refugee story is horrific and, and it makes you sick to your stomach when you read about it or watch some of the footage of what happened. Whereas there's this sick, twisted kind of thing when you're watching the submersible story where you're like, it's almost a smugness, like a self-righteousness. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. they kind of deserve it There were, it there were down, a lot of people watching you know? that story, not with concern, but with der right. derision. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah. Comedic derision. So, okay, yeah. that, so, so both icky. sides of that reflect poorly on us. The yes. reason we ignored the, <laughs> yes, the refugees and the reason we paid attention to the rich guys both yes. reflect we want to see the rich get eaten by their own hubris, but that's a boy. Is that an old story? You know, mm -hmm. the, the, your own your own greed brings you down. How how Greek is that? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if we don't see you your life as having much value, we don't count it as much of a loss. You know, and if it's just a bunch of a bunch of people from other cultures, just crowding on over, overcrowding a boat well that you know that happens all the time but i also feel like weirdly one of them is slightly easier to relate to from for some people like even if <laughs> you don't ever plan on spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars to go see the titanic you can imagine doing something sort of risky that requires money and having some scary thing happen whereas the whole like surrounding conditions under which you would be fleeing for your life from a war-torn country right. and like having to make those kinds of decisions is not something lots of people who are like spending time tweeting about this right. have a lot of experience with which is indicative of larger problems of like what we care about politically and socially is often determined by what we can imagine ourselves yeah experiencing. like so in other words we can't empathize with the refugees nope. but I, we can it's empathize. harder yeah yeah right I can I could imagine going to Disneyland, getting on the Nemo sub, and then it getting stuck, you know, and then bad things. Did happen. that happen to you, Phil? No, but I could. I've been on the Nemo subs at Disneyland, uh -huh. and even the, yeah. the old Captain Nemo subs from way way before the the Finding Nemo rebrand. I've been on those subs. I could see it going wrong. I, and when I yeah. when you know when I watch a story about someone in one of those river raft rides and their raft flips upside down and their seat belted in, that's bad. And I can picture myself there. That is an entirely yeah. relatable yeah. experience. Um, I don't relate to migrant caravans. I don't relate to, you know, running from a war. I don't relate to any of that. So it's pretty easy for me to just kind of say, next story. What's next? Yeah. What's next? Oh, that's a really cute puppy. Oh. Go going back to the beginning of it, though, Phil, I think yeah. that was the biggest factor, the one you mentioned. The, the 
the message that there was these five people trapped somewhere deep under the ocean running out of oxygen like that's it's like a nightmare story yeah. and it's going to draw people's attention the suspense of it all yeah whereas that fact the suspense factor didn't exist with the the refugee boat mm-hmm. yeah um and that just makes for compelling television okay speaking of a lack of empathy <laughs> how's that for a segue <laughs> uh, Stephen Wolf is the Christian nationalist author of the best-selling book, A Case for Christian Nationalism. He wrote a piece for, um, what's the publication? American Reformer. The American Reformer. Do you subscribe to the American Reformer, Sky? No? I do not, okay. no. And um, I didn't read the piece. Steve, um, William Wolf, another Christian nationalist, glowingly retweeted the piece and summarized it thusly. Recovering a foundation of true Christian hospitality in America. Okay, are you with me so far? Recovering a foundation of true Christian hospitality in America will demand a mass deportation of the millions of illegal aliens who, quote, disrupt and harm the communal life of our nation, unquote. Right. So wait, if I get this straight, hospitality means get the hell out. Um, if you're disrupting the communal life of our nation. Right. Beca- okay, got it. Uh, and this is a strain, this is a strain that Stephen Wolf has developed quite a bit and other people have jumped on yeah. that um, you you owe more loyalty and more love to your own people than to other people. First, starting with your own family, so there's a hierarchy of love, and it's you know, and there's a theologian who cre- created the concept of a hierarchy of loves, and your highest love is to your own family, secondary t- <coughs> to your own people, and then after that, it can be to whoever else is is the next closest. So, if a a group of people from a um, lower love obligation is disrupting the life of people with a higher love obligation, you should remove those people, get them out. And that's, and Christian hospitality demands it. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I read, can I read something really quick? Yes. Yes, you can. Is it the Bible? Don't. don't. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Oh. What? You're supposed to say snap. I want to hear Caitlin say, oh, snap. (laughs) Say it. I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. It would win you so many fans among the youngsters. And lose my soul. (laughs) (laughs) It it feels like the wolves... Because there's two wolves. Yes, there's they're two William wolves, and, and they're not Stephen related. Wolf. The wolves it's a small here pack seem, of wolves. seem to okay. be intent on lowering the bar of Christian obedience rather than raising it to the level that Jesus calls us to. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here um, because there's just there's more of this circulating. It's you know the Doug Wilsons and Mere Christendom and all these conferences where. The Wolves and the Wilsons and other like-minded thinkers are showing up. So, you know, uh, William Wolfe and uh, Denny Burke, I think, wrote the, co-wrote the statement on Christian nationalism that they're trying to get everyone to sign on to, like the Danvers statement, another, you know, the Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy to try to officially define Christian nationalism as something that every Christian should be in favor of. And there, there are these tendencies, particularly in American culture, you know, historically to, um, ex- to try to figure out a biblical basis to exclude people. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't like those people. We don't like those. Those people are not our people. We want to exclude them. How can we support that in church? How can we preach a sermon about that? How can we sell that in in the pews and obviously you know the 19th century was a wash in that sort of thing with dueling use of the bible for and against slavery and then for right. and against segregation and then for and against feminism and then you know we're for and like every issue because we're such a bible drenched culture society 
whatever the issue is, we'll figure out how to make the Bible line up on our side. And I'm just, I'm, so they're coming out of Jim Crow and, you know, the 19th century where the Southern church was so compromised uh, by racism and using the Bible to justify it. Here's what I'm wondering. It, it, 30 years ago, it seemed like, you still with me, Caitlin? You still with me? I bet you're, uh, yeah, really, yeah. I bet you're really curious where I'm going. Are you curious where I'm going, Caitlin? Mm -hmm. I can smell it. Um, 30 years ago, it's, it felt like we all looked at that and said, oh, that was a bug. That was a bug, not a feature. Sorry, everybody. And everyone agrees that we've set that aside. And that's not Christianity. It feels like th some of those old Southern bugs are becoming features that are attracting some people to this strain of Christianity. And I'm wondering if that's actually happening or if it's just always been there and social media is just making it more visible. I think I got the Southern bug once when I ate some bad crawfish. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Okay, I'm good. You're not taking it seriously. So, Caitlin, Caitlin, forget about Sky. I mean, okay, great. <laughs> Caitlin. I do, I think what you're describing, Phil, that's really important for us to, to grapple with is the fact that we do inherit not only certain kind of habits of being Christian, certain ideas of what it means to be Christian, we inherit certain habits of reading the Bible and what we assume is important and how it should apply to certain things. I mean, there are certain things that you could look back in that era and think that's so done. No one is ever shaped by that anymore. Mm -hmm. I've been in a Bible study in 2020 in a church in Texas where someone pulled out their old Schofield reference Bible and, look, and we were reading Genesis and they got to the curse of Ham and they went down and looked and it had a description of how this justified at least the segregation of black people in America. So like, we're not very distanced from some of these poor ways of reading scripture. Yeah. I think that that's absolutely true. I also think because you've opened the door to me talking about the Bible. I'm going to briefly talk about the hey, Bible. More, hey, we've which got, is, as I mentioned, it's only three days since we recorded the last one. So <laughs> we're a little light on news in the last 72 hours. Which is great. We need more Bible go, than news, yes, honestly. Go for it. And I, I really do think, like, there's a paradigmatic example in Scripture of hospitality, and that's in Genesis 18, 19, and 20. The first of those three chapters is the example that's referenced later in the New Testament of you might entertain angels without knowing it, right, as Abraham welcomes these three guests. In parts of the Christian tradition, we've thought of that as the Trinity. It's been a visual description of the Trinity. Um, crucial to that story is that Abraham does the right thing by welcoming these strangers that he doesn't know anything about. Underlying this article about hospitality is this idea that there's certain worthy people that maybe we extend hospitality to, we shouldn't have to sacrifice, it shouldn't cost us very much. And if they hurt us in any way, then that means we don't have to be hospitable. This paradigmatic story that comes up again in the New Testament is like, this is what it means, this is why hospitality is so good. They had no idea who these people were. Mm -hmm. Like they had no way of judging beforehand if they were worthy of entering or not. Then you have in 19 and 20 in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we've talked about before, I like I hate how much that story has been described as about sexuality when it is so clearly, Ezekiel says it's about their lack of caring for the poor and vulnerable. In that story, you do see an example that could be what Wolf is talking about, where Lot is trying to protect these visitors. He's being appropriately hospitable and saying, you will be sexually assaulted if you stay out in the kind of common area. If you're out in the city square, come into my house. When people bang on the door and want to have the strangers come out so that they can assault them, he offers up his two daughters. If that's the kind of situation you're thinking of, then yeah, that's wrong. You don't sacrifice vulnerable people to take care of other vulnerable people. Like there mm -hmm. are still things that are wrong. The problem with Wolf's argument where he's basically saying like, no, hospitality has these kinds of restraints. And some of those restraints are you prioritize people closest to you and it shouldn't hurt you at all, is that we are not good judges of what is like actually a threat to us and what actually harms us. So in that kind of extreme example, Lot should not be offering up his daughters. Like they're also vulnerable. They shouldn't be subject to violence just to keep someone else safe. However, the way the logic actually usually works in America is more like I should have everything I want in life. And if you infringe upon that at all, then that's harming me in some way. So if immigrants come, if refugees come, and that means I, in order to care for them, am taxed a little higher, or they're, they're in my community and they receive public services, and I don't get 
every abundant thing that I want, that's harming mm-hmm. me. And I would just be wary that we would be good judges of actually what is, is harming us. What Caitlin, what you're describing there, and this is, I read Wolf's piece and it's really, really awful. Um, like is like he's ta- bad grammar or what? No, bad, bad theology okay. and bad argumentation. But what he does there is he, he takes that very definition you just mentioned of anything that um, restricts my desire or or impulses is a violation of my rights and I shouldn't have to do it. He's taking that kind of definition of hospitality and generosity and then imposing it upon the scriptures and upon Christian values. When you actually study hospitality in the ancient Near East, it was profoundly important to the ancient world. And what you see Abraham doing in that chapter where the visitors come, the angelic visitors that he doesn't know are angels, is practicing a very ancient form of hospitality that still exists today. And I'll give you an example. When I was, I think I was 20 or 21 years old, I was traveling in Turkey as a college student with a small group of other students. And I found myself in Tarsus, which was the Apostle Paul's hometown. And details I won't share, but I was, we were wandering the streets of Tarsus, the sun was going down, and we were clearly fish out of water, didn't belong there. It was getting kind of weird. And we eventually got invited into the home of a stranger. These Muslim people who lived in Tarsus saw us, they welcomed us up into their home, and they fed us dinner. And as I'm chowing down, like starving and eating this meal in these strangers' homes, I'm realizing that none of them are eating. And I was talking to one of the other students I was with, like, why aren't they eating? And he pointed out that they gave us their dinner. Mm. And that's, and, and it, it's just the way hospitality is practiced in the, in the Middle East. And in the ancient world, it was always, you give your best to the stranger. You welcome them. You care for them. Because at some point, you are going to be in their shoes. And it's just an expectation that you do this. They didn't interrogate us. They didn't ask us who we were, where we were from, what we wanted. They just saw us as a bunch of stupid American college students that needed help, and they helped us. That's closer to the biblical hospitality that Paul commands in Romans 12, closer to the hospitality that Abraham exhibited, and Lot, for that matter. And that's what we're commanded to do, is give to the stranger who is in need. It's the Good Samaritan. You don't base your hospitality on, do I have everything I need? It's, what does that person need? And that's what's modeled in the person of Jesus as well. And and Wolf just completely ignores that tradition, that biblical precedent, all of that to say, well, once I'm completely taken care of, then maybe I'll consider taking care of you. And that is not the posture of God or his character. Okay, so I, I tweeted about this story um, somewhat critically. I was not a fan of the position that all uh, illegal aliens should be deported in the name of Christian hospitality. I was not a fan of that position. And some of the responses that I've gotten are, you know, in, in making any sort of biblical appeal to you know, welcoming the, the mm. stranger or the foreigner is that, uh, but in the Bible, did they come illegally? You know, did <laughs> they break into the country? Um, also, that's for Israel, not for America. We're not Israel, which is, you know, okay. Mm-hmm. So what do you say? It's in the New Testament. It's in that? the New Testament also. That's why I referenced Romans 12. Oh, okay. Also, the Old Testament, like, matters to us. Mm-hmm. That's still relevant. Yeah, but when, it, when we say don't, don't take a blessing or a curse that's given to Israel and apply it to America. Isn't that what we're saying? That's not for America. That's for Israel. It it depends. We are always sorting through in the Old Testament mm-hmm. what is specific to Israel and what is God revealing how God expects. And also, oh gosh, this is so important. It's like that's not actually just <laughs> given towards Israel in the right. Old Testament. It is the most frequent indicator of how God judges nations. That's how. That's the whole end of that story in Genesis, is that the nation in which Abraham and Sarah end up in is blessed because the king is hospitable to them, even though they don't deserve, they're the perfect example. They go in, they lie, they mistreat people, actually. Mm-hmm. They're still treated with hospitality, and God blesses that nation. And we yeah. are a nation among the nations that are described that way. You know, the, the commandment to not commit murder was also given to Israel, but no one says that doesn't <laughs> apply to us anymore. We actually want the Ten okay. Commandments on the walls of all um, our schools. Okay, right. next ob- objection. Next objection. Christian hospitality is a command to individuals, not to nations. No. Again, nope, that's what it says. Yeah. It's all about nations. 
It's like one of the most Jewish, clear things in the Old Jewish Testament. Jewish hospitality. If it's in the Old no, Testament, it's, not. it's Jewish no, it's hospitality. Not. It's to other nations. Yeah, it's applied to non-Jewish, non-Israelite countries as well. They are not judged. Well. There are lots of things they're not judged for. It would be true to say, hey, there are some provisions of the Jewish law that the other nations are not held accountable for. This one, though, mm -hmm. they are held accountable for. Okay, okay. So uh, you don't think there's any uh, way to get around this that we're supposed to be hospitable to strangers? Are you looking? You're looking for a way. <laughs> I'm just looking through my my Twitter responses. I think a, a, a defensible position would be that America's immigration policy is really screwed up and broken, and it really needs to be reformed. Not because it's harming natural born American citizens, but because it's actually harming immigrants and refugees and American citizens, we need to reform a system to make it more hospitable and just and compassionate. But to say um, we don't have to show compassion or hospitality to anyone who wasn't born here is not mm -hmm. Christian. Okay. So I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that we need to reform the system to make it function yeah. better and more justly. Um, I am not a defender of the current system because it is really screwed up. But to say we don't have to care for anybody okay, anymore what is about, uh, way off the radar. <laughs> one, of, one of our fine Christian nationalist fellows said the other day on Twitter, um, the command to take provide for our relatives, you must provide for your relatives, you know, woe to he who does not mm -hmm. care for his own family. That right. is a command to prioritize your family above others. It's a, no, it's not. It's a command to make sure your family is sufficiently cared for. Above others. No. It means, our, like, it's hard to make a case that Americans caring for foreigners or immigrants is taking away the ability to care for Americans. If and without the, raising taxes, and we don't want to raise no, taxes. No, but I mean, there's a lot to say that even even non-documented immigrants are contributing more to the American economy than they're taking, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And they're actually paying taxes in a way. It's, it's a complicated topic. But my point is, like, I, I make more money than my family needs to survive. And so I can't say, if somebody knocked on my door and said, hey, I need, I need a meal tonight, I would not be justified in saying, I can't help you because that meal could have been going to my family. My yeah. family will not suffer if I've given that person a meal. And that's true for most households in America are not going to suffer by showing more compassion to people beyond their family. Kayla? It's also a very weird move from that verse to the nation, especially because modern nations are like a modern invention. The idea that you should feel most obligated to this kind of imaginary community that we drew some borders around isn't isn't immutable. That's not yeah. like inevitable. That's not how it's always been. So even, I mean, in plenty of the lines that we have drawn in the last you know century where we've kind of come up with this idea of a nation state that didn't exist before, didn't exist in scripture, didn't exist prior to the like invention mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. we often drew lines that didn't make sense. We mm -hmm. drew lines, especially in colonized areas, that cut through people groups that right. did actually have strong associations but with Caitlin, each other. But Caitlin, that is exactly why Stephen Wolf says our loyalty is to our ethnic group. First, that's our loyalty. Well, first of all, no one in America is like really fully living in the ethnic group that they supposedly come from. That's not the community that's around them. That's incredibly rare, both because all of us have long lineages that are confusing and most of us either came as immigrants or were brought here by force mm -hmm. in enslavement. So it's not like we can just go back to an imagined past in which that was actually true. But the important thing is, that's like part of the message of the New Testament is that the lines that we have drawn by biology and ethnicity and class and all of these things that we tend to think are just natural and immutable and often are not, they're often imagined in some sense, even the biological connections we have, sometimes they're not as close as we like think that they actually are, yeah. are superseded by the family of God that spans all of those other divisions that we have between humans. It doesn't mean, I actually think the little core truth that he is getting at here is that it doesn't completely 
just get rid of the fact that we will feel special obligations to Mm -hmm. family members, to people who are similar to us, to the community that we come from. But we don't live in a world where the community we come from is this like pure ethnic group that's not shaped by outside forces. Thank God, we've had such great gifts by the mixing of people in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem with his description is just that like, that's not real. That's not the world that we live in. And actually, the Holy Spirit has been involved in a lot of those changes in groups of people and relationships throughout time in order to bring the gospel to places where it wasn't before. So if we're going to have an issue with the intermingling of all these people groups over time, I think we're really having an issue with the work of the Holy Spirit Ooh. among the people of God. Ouch. Oh, Caitlin, can, ouch. That hurt. Oh, ow. Can, can we drill down to the what yes. I think is the un, unspoken and real problem with his whole argument? Drill away. As much as everything we've said so far I think is relevant. Are, we looking, for, issue, are we looking for oil or are we trying to get rid of a cavity? Uh, I think it might be the cavity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Drill. So the the core assumption that he's making is one of scarcity. And I'm really indebted to Walter Brueggemann and his writing about this, where he talks about that the 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 empires outside of God's kingdom, the empire specifically of Egypt in the Old Testament, was an empire of scarcity. If you remember, Pharaoh was threatened by the the growth of the Hebrews mm-hmm. of the of the enslaved Israelites. And he was worried that if they got too numerous, that they would take over and his reign would be threatened. And so he orders that all the, the Hebrew baby babies be killed, the boys. And that introduces this concept of scarcity, this idea that there's not enough for everybody, so let's destroy those who are not us. And when you read the rest of the biblical narrative, especially the Exodus narrative, what you find is that with Yahweh, with the God of Israel, there's always abundance. So they, they go out into the wilderness, and there's not enough water, there's not enough food, and he creates water from rocks and manna from heaven, and their clothing never wears out, and their shoes last for 40 years. There's always abundance with God. And that's sort of the, one of the core tensions you see throughout the scriptures. And you get to the New Testament, there's not enough to eat, and Jesus says, well, give me what you've got. And it's a couple of fish and a couple of loaves, and he multiplies it, and there's an abundance for everybody. And what Wolf is saying here is there's not enough resources, there's a scarcity, And you need to make sure that you and your family and your people and your nation have enough, which means you need to kick out the people that shouldn't be there. In such language, he is acting and posturing himself more like Pharaoh than he is like Moses. He's behaving more like the empires that God was opposed to than he is behaving like someone who belongs to the kingdom of God, who believes in the miraculous abundance and provision of God. And for the church or God's people to say, I'm not going to help you because there's not enough, is a betrayal of the kingdom we are called to. Mm. And that's why Jesus says, don't be afraid. If strangers need something, give it to them. If someone's going to force you to walk one mile, walk two. If someone asks for your cloak, give them your tunic as well. You will be taken care of because my kingdom is one of abundance. You can give and bless and serve even your enemy because I've got you. And what Wolf is saying is you can't trust God's provision. You can't believe in his abundance. So you need to be all about you and your own tribe and screw everybody else. That is not the way of Jesus. Here's what I would like to see happen. You want to know what I would like to see happen? I, w- I would just like uh, several members of a um, uh, indigenous Native American nation to approach Stephen Wolf and just say, um, your presence is disrupting and harming the communal life of our nation. Please leave. Bam. Okay. But that's that's actually felt like that's where you find the little grain of truth in what he's saying. Mm. It is possible Mm -hmm. for that to happen. It is not usually, it's not ever, like vulnerable people in need that are like exerting supposed imagined power against, I mean, in what world are people who are in need of like basic necessities who come to the United States for that, suddenly having so much power that they can just kind of Mm -hmm. change the supposed unified national culture we have that is just Mm -hmm. non-existent. That's, and it's actually been like the strength of us that we haven't had that. It reminds me, um, Thomas Jefferson pre in, in colonial days was a huge booster of Virginia and the Virginian way of life. And, you know, so he wrote his book on the, on Virginia and the, his model of the new man who was a landowner and, you know, and industrious and creative and, 
And he thought this, and so when they start talking about America, it's like, this is what it will be. It will be a, a nation of Virginian men like me. And then he was invited to go to, I think it was the first Congressional Congress or one of the first meetings in New York City. And he'd never been to New York City before. And he went to New York City and he was horrified. He was horrified <laughs> at the culture of New York City because he, he said all of the vices of the old world have come here and are in this city. And what he was facing was this is not a monolithic culture even now i thought it was i thought yeah. my experience in virginia was the universal experience in this new world and it's it's just not so so bringing together the colonies were melting multiple cultures you know from the beginning and it never became one culture the virginia right. culture was always different than the new york city culture um, and it grew even and that's ultimately the civil war was about how we are not melting our cultures very well together um, and we don't want to and we don't even want to so there was never and this is the argument from from stephen wolf and others is that there was once an american culture and it is being destroyed and we must recapture the American culture. Ironically, if you follow Stephen Wolf on Twitter, he lives out in the woods by himself and, and farms. So he's not living in a uh, demographically diverse uh, area and thinks diversity is, a, if you have no positive exposure to diversity, you might come to the conclusion that diversity is scary and will undermine but, everything that's important to you. But I mean, part of that I think is actually really admirable I know this is going to sound strange, but like America is a big enough, diverse enough, and spacious enough country that if you just want to live in a monolithic little community where everyone functions, you can do that mm -hmm. in America. You can go out to the woods. If that's what he wants, God bless him. He has every right to go do that. But to impose that upon the rest of America that may want a pluralistic, diverse society is where he's taken it too far. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Caitlin, what's coming up this week? What exciting thing do you have now that this last week you recorded your first explainer videos, which was obviously the highlight of your summer so far. What's, right. what's happening next that you're going to have fun with? I'm still just learning German. Oh, it's not exciting. It's great. just... <laughs> Just learn in German. That's great. Yeah. You know, it was illegal to learn German in, uh, in Nebraska in 1910. Really? Yeah, I got overthrown by this. I wish court. I lived in Nebraska. <laughs> Caitlin, what does that look like? Are you doing like a Rosetta Stone thing? Is it a computer program? Yeah. How are you learning it's German? It's a class. There's, oh, yeah. a, there's a German PhD oh. student who's helping us learn. Okay, so there's some communal component to it. You're not just alone. Yeah, it's on Zoom. Do but you, yeah. does, does he have yeah. the whole class stand, stick straight in a line and yell out German phrases yeah. at the top of their lungs? Absolutely that, not. That might He's creep nice. out the classes around you. <laughs> That would not be good. No, no, no. Do you ever no. We're just reading too. We're not. Do you guys speak. You guys march around the square at Duke, uh, counting in German very loudly, as you absolutely as you not. No. Come on, throw me a bone. I need a video <laughs> of your class yelling together in German very loudly. I don't think I can get that for no. you. No. So mm -hmm. okay. I've never I've never studied German, but I've always been freaked out by how long the words are. Okay, you know what's so messed up about this? Mm -hmm. The way they decide how we get tested for any language you learn, I have to do French and German, other people do different languages, is word count. But German puts yeah. like six words in one Man. word, but that counts as one word, so we have to do so much more. <sighs> That's not right. How silly is that? That's not right. Thanks, Germany. You're ruining Caitlin Schess's life. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Okay. Hey, everybody. We're a little short this week, and that's okay, because we got a great interview, and it was a short week for the news, and we're going to come back next time with something amazing and huge, and you're going to love it. But I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> so thanks for supporting us. Uh, go to holypost.com. Check out Holy Post Plus, because Caitlin and Sky just finished recording two more. Uh, Get Schooled by Caitlin Schess, where she teaches us. It's German, right? The, this latest round of classes is no, all about no, learning no, German no. with Caitlin. Okay, maybe uh, not. Schess is German. German. Yeah, Shess is German. It is German. As is Vischer. As is Vischer. Don't look it up. How about Jatani? I don't have is any German. German. No German. No German in me. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Oh, good for no, you. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Or you you can't join our little parades, our little yelling in German parades that Caitlin and I are going to have. Uh, yeah, usually, I when, will also not be joining. <laughs> usually, when Germans are in a parade yelling, the world gets a little nervous. Uh huh. I just want to watch sorry. the fun. I just want to watch the fun. Okay. Thanks, y'all, for your support. Have a great week, and we will see you next time. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. Life can be overwhelming. God made us for relationships and calls us to be in community, but people can be hard. Relationships can be strained, even our most important relationships. I've found it helpful at times to sit down with a trained therapist to talk things through, and Faithful Counseling makes that easier to do. Faithful Counseling can help you find a therapist that works for you. With more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states, it's easy and free to change counselors until you find the right fit. Plus, it's more affordable than traditional in-office counseling and financial aid is available. Whether you're struggling with family conflicts, trauma, anxiety, stress, or depression, Faithful Counseling can match you with a therapist who can help. Continue growing into the best version of yourself. Visit faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post and get the professional faith-based counseling you need. They've even got a special offer for our listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first First month at faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. Thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Blue Land. Did you know we throw away an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning product bottles every year? And lots of that plastic ends up in our water supply so that each of us are eating roughly a credit card's worth of plastic each week. Yuck! I don't want to eat plastic. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic. Their idea is simple. They offer endlessly refillable cleaning products with a beautiful design that looks great on your counter. Just fill the bottles with water, drop in Blue Land tablets, and wait for them to dissolve. You'll never ever have to buy giant bottles of cleaning supplies again. From cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner, and laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. And Blue Land has an offer just for Holy Post listeners. Get 15% off your first purchase of any product. To get 15% off your first order, go to blueland.com slash holy post. You won't want to miss this. blueland.com slash holy post. That's blueland.com slash Holy Post, and thanks to Blue Land for sponsoring this episode. For as long as I can remember, the popular narrative about religion and politics has been that conservative evangelical Christians are the most influential religious group in the country. But that may be changing. As the number of evangelicals continues to drop and the number of non religious Americans grows, it may have huge implications for both politics and all of society. And recent data shows something surprising. Atheists are now more politically active than evangelicals. To help us understand the data and explain its implications, I'm delighted to have Ryan Burge back on the show. Ryan is an associate professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University, and he's a pastor. A rare combination for sure. But he's also gained a reputation for being one of the best at analyzing the role of religion in public life. You'll find his work in the New York Times, Washington Post, and he's been featured on CNN, CNBC, and many other mainstream news outlets. But he's recently reached the pinnacle of media exposure as one of our brand new Holy Post pundits. I highly recommend you follow Ryan on social media and Substack. His insights are always thought-provoking, as you'll hear in this conversation. Here's my interview with Ryan Burge. Ryan Burge, welcome back to the Holy Post. Always a pleasure to see you, Sky. Well, you are officially a Holy Post pundit now, so you you know you kind of carry the brand. This is this is your thing now. And yeah, man, I got a Tumblr, the, the, the Yeti mug, the, the Yeti mug with Holy Post pundit on it. I am getting all the accolades in the world right now. This is better than getting tenure. Oh yeah, clearly, really. clearly, it's a, it's a huge benefit. <laughs> all right, uh, you are all over the place, and you're constantly posting fantastic stuff, both on on Twitter and especially on your Substack page. Uh, all the data research, you are our guide to this stuff, and super grateful for it. You wrote a piece last month titled "No One Participates in Politics More Than Atheists," and you are flipping some conventional wisdom on its head here because for decades we've been told that it's evangelical Christians who are hyper politicized, 
and are driving our politics in America and they determine who was president in 2016 and they have all this power as we go into 2024. So start walking us through the argument that it's actually atheists who are the hyper-politicized religious identification group in America. Yeah, well, first, first we got to put the, the quotation mark around religious group when we talk about atheists because they get so mad at me sure. saying we're an, we're an anti-religious know. group. And I'm like, I don't know what else to call you if I'm comparing you to white evangelicals because they're a religious group and you are kind of a religious group, but just not, you know what I mean? So caveats aside, you know, I grew up in the 90s when like the religious right was like really picking up steam with Falwell mm-hmm. and Robertson and all that stuff. And the media narrative from that point forward really has been Look how engaged and activated the religious right is in America. Like, this is how we get Roe overturned. This is how we elect George Bush. This is how politics works. The religious right is the most powerful force in American politics. You hear this over and over and over again. And I don't want to discount that, okay? There are still a lot of religiously active, engaged voters on the right of American politics, but... I don't think people realize like atheists are, and I think what the, 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 sort of like the breadcrumb for me, which got me to think about this more deeply was my mentions on Twitter. When I talk about politics, it's almost always the atheists that get into my mentions, my replies and start talking to me about atheists and how bad evangelicals are and talking about trans Mm -hmm. issues and gay issues and abortion issues and all this kind of stuff. And I was thinking to myself, wow, like they are like, I wonder if Twitter is not real life, right? They're really engaged on Twitter, but they're not really engaged like in the nuts and bolts of everyday politics. So I started, I have this data that basically asks people really simple political questions. Have you done any of the following stuff in the past 12 months? And it's not even like super political stuff. It's like attend a local school board meeting. Uh, or a city council meeting, contact a public official, attend a protest or a march, uh, put up a political sign, like a bumper sticker or a yard sign, donate money to a candidate or campaign or work for a candidate or campaign. And on every one of those metrics, atheists are at the top, if not the top, the most, pl- the one that really stands out to me is the group that's the most likely to put up a political yard sign in America today are atheists. 27% of them put up a political yard sign. White evangelicals, it was only 21%. And that's a funny one to me because it's like, that's the most basic thing you can do if you want to be politically engaged is just put a bumper sticker up. or It doesn't cost you any money because usually they give it to you for free. Right. It takes 30 seconds to put up. And even then, atheists are doing that at a rate that far exceeds the national average and far exceeds anyone on the religious right, really. Yeah, I mean, if you go to your Substack page, people can see the stats. I know it's hard to sometimes grasp this when you're just listening to a podcast or hearing it, but when you see it on these graphs, it's dramatic that people who say they have no faith or believe there's no God disproportionately engage in political activism from as simple as the yard sign all the way up to you know financial donations and, and protesting and marching and stuff like that. Do you have a theory as to why this is the case? I know that's harder to get straight from the numbers, Mm -hmm, so I'm asking you to mm -hmm. kind of create a narrative here, but why are atheists so active, do you think? Okay, so I think that a lot of a lot of atheists say are converts, obviously, right? Like very even today, very few people are raised in an atheist household. Probably less than five percent. So almost Mm -hmm. everyone who's an atheist today got there on their own volition. They weren't raised that way. So you got to think like what would be the logical steps for someone to go from being a Catholic or Protestant or whatever to being an atheist? It's going to have to be something major because if you look at the data about stigma around social groups, atheists are the most stigmatized. I know white evangelicals like to say they are. They are not. Right, atheists right, right. are easily the most stigmatized social group in America today. Like if you ask people, would you be upset if your son or daughter married someone from blank group? Atheists always score the worst. Like no one wants their kid to marry an atheist. So to take right. on that label you got to take on a lot of junk, right? A lot of baggage that comes with being an atheist. And I think for a lot of them, it's a reaction. It's a reactionary message to largely their evangelical or conservative Catholic or conservative Protestant upbringing. They're rejecting that. And if you look, and it's just like some weird anecdote things, like when I get emails from like atheist organizations, because there's actually some really well-developed, well-funded atheist organizations in America today, almost always you see pronouns in bio. So, you know, like you see, like this is this has become the haven for people who are LGBTQ because that's they probably grew up religious and then had a, you know, sort of violent reaction to that and now have become mm-hmm. atheists as sort of a counterbalance to that upbringing. And I think that is what politically charges them because they 
we're shaped by how we grew up. And if we grew up in a religious right kind of household in a worldview, that we think that's the entire world. So we sort of overinflate how big that group is and then engage in politics at a high level to counteract what we perceive as being a very active religious right in America. Yeah, I, w- I wonder if instead of labeling them atheists, is, is it just better to label them anti-religious? And <laughs> that, because yeah, atheism, yes. atheism is, is, a, is a term that is a, asserting a, a positive belief in the non-existence of a deity, right? It's a naturalistic worldview and all that. But, and this is anecdotal, but in my engagement on social media with people who claim this label, I'm not hearing very many advocate for a truly materialistic, scientific, naturalistic worldview. What I hear is them arguing against traditional religion. And that's mm-hmm. a different posture to take. Okay, um, I I think you're right, but here's here's my theory <laughs> to to build Go on ahead, yours yeah. and yeah. tell me if I'm completely bonkers here. Um, I think that all of us, every human being, has religious impulses, and what I mean by that is we we seek purpose, we want meaning, we are looking for causes to drive our lives, to give us a sense of definition of belonging, all these are religious impulses, or at least they're impulses that traditional religion has fulfilled. But when you reject traditional religions, you still have those impulses and they have to go somewhere. And so, you know, being from an evangelical background, or if you're Roman Catholic or even Muslim, if you have that religious foundation, then you also have a sense of, well, my mission in this world is to advance the gospel, or it's to spread Islam, or it's to, uh, you know, advocate for holiness and morality in my community, or to raise children, and so like, you have a sense of mission. But if you are really an atheist, you need to figure out, well, well, what's my purpose then? What's my sense of mission? Years ago, I was on a panel of, you know, diverse religious panel at Northwestern University, and it included a couple of atheists as well as Jews and Muslims and Christians and Catholics and all that. And what was fascinating to me when it came to the question of mission at that time, the atheists on the panel said that their mission was all about environmentalism. And that the light bulb went off for me at that moment because it's like, Oh, it makes sense. Of course, if you're an atheist, you need a mission. Where are you going to find that? Cause it's not coming from a holy book. It's not coming from a religious tradition. It's coming from something naturalistic. I wonder if in 2023, those who are non-religious or atheists are going, I need a mission, and they're going to politics. That's their outlet for mission. And that explains the disproportionate number of atheists who are going to these political activities in a way that, you know, a run-of-the-mill kind of conservative Christian evangelical might, yeah, they might vote informed by their faith, but their sense of mission is coming much more from their participation in a congregation or a church not political activism. But an atheist that doesn't have that outlet, all they really have is political activism. Therefore, it's disproportionately high for them. Is that crazy, or do you think there's something there? Let me let me build on that just a second. That's actually a very good point, because there was an article that was just published in the Sociology of Religion Journal, which is like an academic peer-reviewed journal, which no one reads, unfortunately, but there's all kinds of good nuggets, and I'll give you one. This article was asking the question, are atheists less inclined to volunteer than religious people? You know, like, is it, what's the argument here? Is it like they're, 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 they're internally not, not inclined that way or structurally they can't go volunteer? And the answer right. is it's a structural problem, not an internal problem. Atheists still right. have a desire to volunteer at a level that's very similar to Christians, but they don't have the scaffolding right, the apparatus to actually get that volunteerism out because they don't have a method to do that, and religion has that method. And I guess you can make the argument, right, that politics does create some sort of scaffolding to allow them to volunteer in a way that they believe makes the world a better place. So I think that's a really interesting point, by the way. I tell atheists all the time, I want you to get involved in something. Like I don't I'm not going to get into like a, a theological argument about your worldview being defective or not. I honestly that's not my game. I'm a social scientist. What I tell them is you've got to become socially engaged in some way shape or form. You've got to volunteer, you've got to become part of something because that's what religion provided for thousands of years of, of civilization and now you're rejecting that, which okay, whatever. But you need to find from a social science perspective a way to get that itch that you have, that god-shaped hole. You've 
got to find a way to do that. And unfortunately, I don't think the modern atheist community has found a way to actually create that scaffolding they need to get people to volunteer. And I think they're worse for it. And I think America's worse for it because they're not actually doing the things that they really want to do, but just can't. I agree. And okay, so this leads to um, another thing. Others have written about this. I think uh, I think I read Jonah Goldberg wrote about this not too long ago. But there's a growing perception that as religious participation in America declines, and you see the rise of the nuns, which we've talked about ad nauseum on the Holy Post, mm-hmm. with religious participation declining, that religious impulse has to go somewhere. And even though people may not be full-blown atheists, they're just not participating in local congregations and churches and communities the way they used to. And the outlet then is becoming political activism. And people are treating politics as they're looking to get from politics what they used to get from religion, a sense of identity, a sense of tribe, a sense of mission, a holy war even, what's good and evil. And that's not good for America. If Some people say this is what's behind the rise of Christian nationalism, is it... it scratches that religious itch in a political way rather than in a religious way. So are, are atheists sort of the canary in the coal mine? Like they are demonstrating where the rest of the country is going as it becomes less religious. Even if people don't become atheists, are we going to go to politics as our religion, which Europe did in the post, you know, post uh, Protestant Reformation, and it didn't lead to great things. <laughs> that's what I tell them. I go, listen, everyone goes, we get rid of religion, we'll be a lot better country. I go, look at Western Europe. They've got no xenophobia. Exactly. There. Everything has been figured out. Like they're right. a, a thriving. Yeah. Uh huh. Anyone who goes to Europe realizes in some ways they're more xenophobic and more racist than we are in America in certain places. Like it's not the solution to your problem. Like you're searching for us. That's not it. So the bigger question is, well, is this a canary in the coal mine? I think in some ways, yes, but in some ways, no. And, I'll, and I'll, let me expl- explicate that a bit. So, among the nuns, about one in five are atheists and about one in five are agnostic, but most nuns are a group called nothing in particular. And that's what they actually check. That's the box they check on. The, it's like it's like picking none of the above, right? Look at all the options right. and go, I'm not an atheist, but I'm not a Christian either. Boom, none of the above. Amongst young people, the plurality pick that option. A third of them say they're nothing in particular. So wow. it is rising. If you look at the rise of the nuns, it's actually the rise of the nothing in particular is with a little bit of bump with the atheist agnostics. That's where most of the work is happening. And if you look at that group of people, they're actually, from a pastoral standpoint and a social science standpoint, really, really dangerous people, really troublesome people because they don't engage in stuff, anything. Educationally, they're one of the least educated religious groups in America today. So, uh, for instance, 51% of atheists have a four-year college degree. That's almost at the top. It's right behind Hindus and Jews. So, like, very, very high. Um, Amongst nothing in particular, it's 25%, which is literally at the bottom. Okay? One-third of nothing in particulars have a high school diploma or less and make $50,000 a year or less as a household. So, which means like a third of them are really falling behind economically. They're not engaging in education, which we just talked about. When you look at these political participation questions we just talked about, they're the least likely to attend a political meeting. They're the least likely to go to a protest. They're the least likely to put up a political yard sign. So what you're seeing is this group is just disconnected, left out, left behind, and lost. They feel like society is not working for them, and I think a lot of them are incredibly angry and incredibly resentful because the the world they thought they could move into, which their parents did, by the way, they got a factory job with a high school diploma, a middle class income, had vacations in a car every five years. Those same jobs don't exist anymore. And if they do, they pay half as much as their parents got paid. I think those are the kind of people who are struggling spiritually, socially, educationally, economically, and we're not talking about them. Atheists are important, but they're 6% of America. Okay. Agnostics are important. They're 6% of America. Nothing in particular are 23% of America and they're growing every year. And I think they represent this really kind of very, very troublesome part of American democracy because they don't build social capital. They don't build connections. They don't feel tied to the community they're in. And therefore, when you don't feel like politics works for you, you drop out. And I I mean, I don't want to draw straight lines between anything, but we talk about things like school shootings, January 6th, the rise in mental health problems. I think some of it has to lie at the feet of these people who are just rejecting all institutions and all social structure. Uh, But if they, if they, carry that religious impulse still, that desire for belonging, for community, for mission, for purpose, 
and they're not finding it in the established institutions of the culture. They're not finding it in religious or congregational life. They're going to find it somewhere. My concern is they're going to find it in some whack job community groups online that are, you know, white nationalists or conspiracy theories or whatever. And that's terrifying. Oh, a thousand. I, I always say people like I don't I don't mind atheist agnostics because a lot of them have a secular worldview. Like they've thrown off right. religion and they replace it with like a scientific rationalist kind of worldview that nothing in particular is we call them non-religious because they've thrown off the religious worldview, but they have not adopted a mental scaffolding to replace that. And I think mm-hmm. and plus add the education piece, the low education piece on top of that. Right. And I think those people, unfortunately, are very highly suggestible and probably more easily radicalized than atheist or agnostics or white evangelicals there's a great podcast called rabbit hole the new york times did a couple years ago it was this guy the, the i love this story this guy was like a typical young kid nothing in particular i right? had no religion at all grew up in iowa went away to college got in trouble for drinking came back home at 20 years old worked at the dairy queen managed the dairy queen and he had no he had no social structure no nothing they asked him what he did all day he watched youtube he watched YouTube videos there 8 to go. 10 hours a day. At one point, he became a far right wing. He watched Stefan Molyneux, who's like a racist, xenophobic, misogynist guy. And he became that guy. And then he goes, a year later, I got sucked into Bernie bro YouTube, and I became a far left socialist communist. Because like he had no sort of like, you know what I mean? Like he had nothing like that. that yeah. He had no one in his life to go, don't believe that, dude. Like that's that's out of bounds of normal, you know, discourse in America right. on both sides. And I think those are the kind of people I worry about the most because they are being discipled, to use a religious word. They are being discipled by something. And I think that something is the algorithms. It's just, it's, and the algorithms being, give you right, more. Right, right, exactly. Want. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is terrifying. <laughs> okay. All right. Let, let me pull us back to your article about – Atheists being the most religious or uh, most uh, politically active group in America, religiously speaking, anyway. Despite all the data you give and all the evidence, there's one glaring piece here that we have to talk about, and that is there's just not as many atheists. So even though they are the most engaged, there aren't a lot of them. So what does that mean when you look at the power and influence of white evangelicals who may be less individually engaged in political political activism but still have more influence because of the sheer numbers of them there's so i think this is such an interesting point because like if you look at the raw numbers between like i use like okay what percentage of america are atheists who donated to a candidate campaign versus white evangelicals who donated to a candidate campaign the difference is only one and a half percentage points of the general population so it's not as large as people think it is. And we know that white evangelicalism is not increasing, probably declining a little bit. Right. And we know atheists are increasing over time. So th- there's a future in the next 10, 15, 20 years where those numbers cross. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where the, the white evangelical donors go below the atheist donors. And I'll say this. If you look at one of my favorite stats, that they ask people to put the parties in political space between one and seven, one being very liberal and seven being very conservative, and they ask people to put themselves in political space you can track how atheists look at the landscape over the last couple years they think the democratic party has become more moderate and the atheists see themselves as becoming more liberal so translate that into the donor class you know what kind of candidates they're going to donate to the ones they see that are pulling the democratic party in the correct direction which is further to the left they're going to favor a candidate like aoc or bernie because that is their so they're not they're not donating to moderate they're not donating to a guy like joe biden they hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden. They want right. a guy like Bernie. Just like well, some a lot of white evangelicals want a guy named Donald Trump. The atheists want a guy like Bernie, and those and those are the donor class, right? Those are the people who drive the debate in Washington, and you better believe it's having an impact on how the DNC and the RNC think about their positioning going forward and what kind of candidates they should run based on who's giving money and why they're giving money. So how does that fit into um, – you know, the When you look at the breakdown of who votes for each party, white evangelicals, obviously 80 plus percent are voting Republican. But one of the most reliable constituencies in the Democratic Party historically, at least since the 1960s, has been black Christians and Mm African-Americans in general voting heavily for Democrats. And from the stats I've seen in different sources, African-Americans are the most orthodox and religious community in the United States. So how does one party appeal to both African-Americans, the most orthodox Christians in the country, and atheists? And who's going to win the day in the Democratic Party? Because if the atheists are, you're saying, pulling that party further and further to the left, 
there's a lot of African Americans who may hold progressive economic and, and, and political views, but they hold a lot of traditional social views. Mm -hmm. Is there a coming civil war in the Democratic Party between those two groups? I, I think it's it's inevitable at this point. And I'll tell you, I think the one issue that's like the tip of the spear on this is the Equality Act, you know, which was bandied about when Biden was running for office. But since he got into office, hasn't really not been talked about a whole lot. And I think for a very good reason, the Equality Act basically says that no, uh, no employer, no organization in America can discriminate against anyone based on their gender identity or sexual orientation, which polls very well. Because people don't think about what it means practically. And what it could mean in some iterations is if a Catholic church has a school and one of the teachers comes out as gay or trans, that, that Catholic church could not fire that teacher or they'd be in violation of the Equality Act. Right or a pastor in a church could come out as gay in a in a Southern Baptist church, and the church could not fire him. Guess what? The, 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 the Supreme Court has always had an exception for religious institutions that, that are exempt that is from correct but if you ask an atheist laws. about it they don't want it they don't want to carve out for religion they say no equality is equality is equality and discrimination is discrimination discrimination in any now i will say this okay here's the pushback here's what churches have done which i think is really bad they've taken the ministerial exception and made it wider right. and wider and wider right so there's a there's a case in in oregon where a guy was a lawyer for a christian nonprofit and he he was gay they found out he was gay they fired him because they said he's a minister and the laws right. of discrimination don't apply to him because he's got the minister. So there's a lot of play in the joints, right, on how big this yeah, minister and, and This is going to be a fight, you know, between, like, let's think, let, let's think, like, um, that's a great example. A school teacher is a great example, but, like, a janitor, right? Is a janitor a minister? I mean, even though he might be right, around right. people every day, let's say he's transgender janitor. Does the Southern Baptist Church want a want a person who was a man dress in a dress or you know women's clothes like cleaning the toilets? I mean that's a very gray area. Now where that comes politically difficult is this: Black Protestants do not want to see the government tell their churches who they can and can't fire. Muslims right. don't want to see you know their synagogues be, or their, their mosques, and Jews don't want to see their synagogues being told by the government who they can hire and fire. Right. Atheists go, oh my gosh, absolutely. Let, let religion take a second place in American society, and Black Protestants and, and you know all these other groups, are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Religion has to have a, a, a privileged place in American society. There is no way to square that circle that will make the atheists happy unless it's a quality act across the board where there is no discrimination in any any organization in america and then black protestants want to carve out and how do you how do you square that circle i don't understand how you you figure out how to do that i mean you know the stats better than i do but i'd be surprised if progressive atheists i mean it sounds to me like they have more important fish to fry than making sure that religious institutions churches synagogues mosques or whatever can't fire anybody i mean they want uh, you know an aggressive pro-choice policy instituted nationwide they somehow want to figure out how to get roe v wade back in place they want uh non-discrimination in every state at least in non-religious institutions first they want far more progressive health care policies and tax policies i can't imagine that the equality act applying to religious institutions is top of their list and if they were able to get everything else with the help of black protestants and the democratic party by giving them a carve out i think that's a pretty good deal that they'd go for maybe i'm wrong you are you, you nuanced public policy does not win the day, Sky. You know, like I think, and I think that's yeah. the problem is like these conversations are new. Like, okay, I'll give you the, the Respect for Marriage Act, right, which just passed Congress, which sort of codified Obergefell, which made you know same sex marriage the law yeah. of the land. I mean, that was a, if you actually read the document, it's actually really nuanced on like it gives religion a wide like. Churches do not have to do same-sex marriages under the Respect for Marriage Act, which was a right. huge, you know, concession for you know the left to give to the right. But it also, you know, get, they got what they wanted. Generally speaking, that's the problem with these discussions. Like I said, the Equality Act polls really well because people don't know what it means, like what, what right. it actually would mean for a local congregation. So I think that's where these well, fights have to happen. The Democratic Party's got a huge problem, though. Like, how do you keep atheists and, and Muslims happy at the same time, and Black Protestants and right. agnostics? Like, those groups are incompatible with each other on all kinds of policy that's not on the economic dimension that's on the social dimension and they're never going to agree the republicans are 75 percent white christian even today so to me if i had to run a campaign right. i'd pick a republican campaign because it's really easy to say white people are good christianity is good white christianity is great you do that you got 75 percent of your base all jazzed up and excited for democrats how do you make atheists and black protestants and old school white catholics and muslims happy all at the same time good luck well, that's that's exactly why you get Joe Biden. 
that's why it's still yes. a, a generally yes. more mod more mod, it's a coalition party um going back to the equality act though I mean, the thing that religious institutions have going for them including when it came to the protection of marriage act and all that that went through is we have the first amendment I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to get challenges to the Supreme Court if the government tries telling a religious institution, here's who you may or may not marry, and here's who you may or may not hire. The Supreme Court has a, a great track record in protecting the, the ministerial exception and uh, uh, keeping government out of religious. I mean, good grief, religious institutions can still say we will not marry an interracial couple. Yeah. Despite how taboo that is in America today, despite all the laws that have been passed that take away, you know, misogyny laws and all that, if you are part of a religious institution, you can legally say, I will not marry an interracial couple, and the government can do nothing about it because we believe so highly in the independence of religious institutions. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Uh, so I think you may, this is like when I think about this, like this is a very thorny issue, obviously, right? Like I do not, I, I don't think the government should ever tell me as a pastor that I have to marry a gay couple or I'll be fined or jailed or whatever. Like, and, and I think right. that goes both, if I think also the interracial thing, I don't think the government should tell a, a church it has to marry a, an interracial couple. Here's how I think religion changes. The free market decides. You know, right. like people are, if your church is saying, we don't think black people and white people should marry, you're going to have a hard time growing and you're going to probably change your message base. Listen, ministers are not right. dumb, right? They're going to change their message. It's amazing. People are like, well, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I go, well, in the 1840s, most American Christians thought that black people were not people. They were, you know, chattel slavery, right? We changed our minds on things. And no, the SBC is meeting this week. They are not fighting about the personhood of black people right now. When they would have 175 right. years ago, because what happens is society changes, right? We 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 we. Oh, and if you even look at the same sex marriage stuff, which I think is so interesting, because if you look at public opinion now, it's 70 percent of Americans are in favor of same sex marriage, including almost half of evangelicals now. And you got to answer, like, how did that happen? Well, here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. We actually there was a survey question in 2007. They asked, what? How would your church approach the issue of a same sex couple? Would it completely prohibit it? Strongly discourage? Somewhat encourage or encourage? In 2007, 67% of evangelicals said their church would prohibit a same-sex couple in their congregation. We asked the same question last year. It was 34% said their church, yeah. their evangelical church, would prohibit a same-sex couple. How did that happen? Did, did pastors come up one day and go, well, we're cool with gay people today? And that's not what happened. What happened was they stopped talking about it. And when you stop talking about it, that gives tacit permission for the people in the pews to go, okay, I think we might be okay with this whole idea. And I think that's exactly how we shifted on the issue of slavery. I think that's exactly how we're going to shift on the issue of same It's not going to be some big declarative statement. It's just a slow I creep agree. over time of not talking about it. And that's, that's how I think the Equality Act happens. It happens from the bottom up, not the top down. And I don't want the top to sort of like short circuit what I think is a more natural, less disruptive process from the bottom up. So as we get kind of toward the end here, wrapping this up, uh, forgetting you know decades down the road, what do you think this means in the short term? And we have a, a presidential election coming up next year. It's already heating up with primaries, and you know it's it's nutty. Are we? Do you anticipate seeing the especially the Democratic Party acquiescing more or throwing more bones to a growing politically active atheist? community or is it just going to be in the background donating a ton of money and having its influence go under the radar so there's this really cool paper that i have my students read my graduate students read where they ask members the staff members of congress people to rate the partisanship of their constituents right to see if they have a good sense of like what their people want and you know what we consistently find is that the staff members consistently think their con their, their constituents are more conservative than they are question is why is that it's because the people who write the letters tend to be like your nra second amendment type folks your pro-life hardcore you know like ideologues write the letters and send the tweets and the emails and do the contacts and unfortunately in america today the left has not done a great job of that and the light rights done a really good job of that like the two the, so two, the second amendment people yeah go ahead it's the squeaky wheels thing. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. The squeaky wheel gets the attention. And you're saying the squeaky wheels are more on the on the conservative end of the spectrum. Right now they are. But I wonder if this yeah. rising class of atheist agnostics sort of balances and creates a squeaky wheel on both sides, especially with the Democrats going, wow, my people want Medicare for all. 
right? Or my people want mm-hmm. the Equality Act because what am I getting? I'm getting 10 or 20 or 30 phone calls a day about those issues. I'm not hearing people who want like a sensible solution to Medicare reform. I'm hearing Medicare for all. So therefore, I'm going to you know tack my policy positions to that side. And I think that's, we're seeing religious polarization on the same lines as political polarization. And what we're seeing is in the future, what we're going to have is there's going to be no one left in the middle. Unfortunately, it's going to be a bunch of evangelicals and traditional Catholics and Muslims and Orthodox Jews and Mormons on one side. On the other side, you're going to have the nuns. And there's really going to be nothing in the middle. And both sides are going to be incredibly loud on their corners about what they want. When the average person in America goes, listen, I don't want abortion up to nine months, but I also don't want a six-week abortion ban either. Those are the only two options you were going to hear from either side. And most Americans are going to feel very left out and disconnected from the process. I think that drives down participation, drives down efficacy, and it drives down social trust which from a a social science perspective is all bad. That's how democracy dies. When the average person doesn't believe democracy is responsive to them, they don't, they don't engage in it anymore. And that's how things fall apart. And I think, unfortunately, that's the future we're headed towards because the polls are the loudest. Moderates don't march sky. They sit at home and go grumble, grumble, grumble. Why can't we get a sensible abortion policy in this country? When all you hear is nine, you know, like my favorite thing is like, the, the explanation for me is uh, DeSantis signs a six-week abortion ban in Florida, and the next day liberals go on TikTok and do a hashtag called Shout Your Abortion about how you should talk about how your abortion was great and you're proud of it. Someone tweeted, abortion's beautiful. Good God. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. listen, no one in America, when, like very few people in America want a six-week abortion ban or less, right? They Very few people want a total ban on abortion, and very few people think abortion should be celebrated. Can we not find a middle ground between those two poles? And unfortunately, we're not going to find one. Okay, so two things before we go. One is I... I'm worried we're already in the world you're describing. That that's Mm. we're there, and and I've talked about this on other shows. Like, I think the way we select candidates in this country and our primary system has killed us. Going back to the 1970s, this was inevitable, and we 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 don't have a way of nominating moderate people in either party because of gerrymandering and the and the primary system is it's just broken through and through which is yeah that's a whole nother thing but going back to something you said earlier you talked about how research has shown that people who are atheists have as much instinct and desire to uh volunteer and serve as anyone else they just don't have the structures to do so Mm -hmm. and when you look at the rise of the religious right back in the 70s 80s and 90s they leveraged the structures congregations churches denominations voter guides mobilizations you know that was all there there aren't atheist congregations in this country so even though that group is growing are we are they really poised to influence politics as much as they could if they don't have those structures to get mobilized to contact your congress representative or you know so mm-hmm. That's why I'm wondering, are the religious side, the conservative religious side, still going to punch way above their weight because they have the structure, whereas the growing nuns and atheists aren't going to punch as heavy because they don't have the structure to do it. And they're just going to get gr- on hashtag and, and, and <laughs> think social media is going to be enough. Digital activism is all we need, right? A nice right. hashtag, will, it will change policy. So I think what's actually happening is the religious right is not nearly as organized as it was 20 or 30 years ago. True. If you look at the right side, like, I mean, the, I don't even know, like people always ask, like reporters will ask me sometimes, like, who should I talk to? Like, who speaks for the evangelicals on this issue? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, who who is the leader? Like, Pat Robertson died last week, right? Like, he was like the, the you know, he and Falwell really kind of, and Wyrick and those guys really led the religious right for like 25, 30 years. There is no one that speaks for evangelicals now because it's become a bottom-up movement because denominations have crumbled and non-denominational right. evangelical Christianity is ascendant now. I mean, 22 million non-denoms, which is like... The SBC is 13 million. Non-denoms are 22 million. So the SBC is really like a, an afterthought now in evangelicalism. And no one wants to talk right. about that, by the way. But so <laughs> now where does the organization happen? Bottom up. Bottom up. Digital activism actually, I think, does work as a somewhat pseudo replacement. And the left has figured that out as well as the right has. So I think like the, the advantage the right had is crumbled because the institutions okay. are crumbling. And now the left and the right are sort of on equal organizational footing and they all have access to the same social media. And I think you can't activate and engage people in ways like on TikTok and YouTube and Twitter in ways that maybe doesn't totally replace what the denominational structure did. 
but does a pretty good job for the left in countering what the right has right now. Well, I, that's, that's amazing. And you're right. It does make sense. We are losing those structures and, and the influence from the top down is gone all across society. Ryan, this is why you are a Holy Post pundit, because you give so much uh, illumination and explanation to these stats and data. And it's fascinating to think about what's coming. Uh, grateful for your writing and analysis and all the stuff you're putting out. We can't wait to have you back on as uh, election season heats up and you can give us more insights into what's happening. Thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure, Sky. Really appreciate Holy Post and all you guys do. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash Holy Post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more. 